I've just finished reading 15 new releases, including August Blue by Deborah Levy, Wayward by Amelia Hart, Your Driver is Waiting by Priya Guns, Bourneville by Jonathan Coe, The Memory of Animals by Claire Fuller, and A Surprise Book of the Year. So let's find out what's worth reading, what's worth avoiding, and what's somewhere in the middle. My name is Scott, and I like to read a lot of new release fiction. If that is your thing, you should hit that subscribe button and stay up to date on all of the best new books or some of the not so good new books that you should avoid and let's see if we can get over a hundred likes on this video please we're gonna jump right in we're gonna start with the worst dnfs and gradually work our way towards the best books in this list the five sorrowful mysteries of andy africa this is a coming of age novel about andrew azia 15 and living in congaro in the north of nigeria often called andy africa by his friends he really likes blondes but he's never seen one except on Pornhub. He discusses big questions in life with his friend Fatima and his teacher Zara. Fatty as he calls her is clearly interested in him. Then Eileen appears. She's white and blonde and Andrew falls in love with her. But this isn't a teen love triangle novel. This is horrible. There are random bits of misogyny thrown in and I'm not sure if that was the author trying to represent society or not. But there was this bit where Andy was going down on Eileen and he's thinking just how demeaning this act is and how Fatty would never make him do this. Meanwhile, the reverse has already happened. And I get if you don't like a certain sexual act or if you're not in the mood to do things, but don't label it as demeaning. I also really hated the pretentious writing. At one point, instead of saying lie, he was saying believe without the B and the E and the V and another E. And I really don't know what that added or why he was doing that. If the author is trying to be intellectual, he's missed a massive chance when he has Zara, Andy and Fatty all discussing maths, black power, evolution, colonialism, quantum mechanics and so much more. More. But he never goes there. He never says anything worthwhile in those conversations. All it is is a chance to build these characters as a combination of intellectual and really actually quite stupid. Which again, I couldn't tell if that was satirical or if that was the author not understanding how things work. And I just don't know what the intention of this book was. It felt like a novel like Ulysses or Native Son, one of those really intellectual and quite confusing novels. But it also wanted to be a YA novel at the same time and it fails on both accounts. I really love Nigerian literature. They produce some fantastic books. But this has to go down as the first truly bad Nigerian novel I have come across. I'm sorry, this is a terrible book. Diket, Jenny Fran Davis. This is a book about rich lesbians meeting older, also rich lesbians, and I'm just not interested in the status games. If I were rich, I'd have a larger backyard, more bench space and cupboard space in my kitchen, better insulation, and a toaster that had a setting somewhere between still cold and sorry, I thought this was a witch. If you look at the online reviews for this book, a lot of people are praising this for the representation of butch and femme lesbians, but they're still only giving it three stars, and I think that tells you all you need to know. Even even the people who like this, they think it's average at best. A boring, rich snob is still a boring, rich snob, even if they're gay. Natural Beauty, Ling Ling Huang. This is a dark comedy dystopian horror take on the beauty industry. That is the kind of description of a book that can go one of two ways. I don't think many people will have trouble believing that the beauty industry is both evil and superficial. I need more. There is a very fleeting hint about beauty standards being racist but it wasn't enough. And this would be all right if the book was funny, but it was just stupid. I know somebody will find this book funny and good on them, but really only read this if you have a ridiculous sense of humor. I did, however, enjoy the main character picking up a man online, going to his home and falling deeply in love with his sister. That relationship was a real saving grace and kept me interested in the book for a lot longer than I should have been. A History of Burning, Janika Oza. This book has a beautiful cover, actually. It has two beautiful covers. I don't know whether I prefer the North American or the European cover. And this is such a Scott-sounding book. It is a novel 
set mostly in Uganda, but also set partly in India. And it's set over a number of years and it follows several members of the Asian community in Uganda. The earliest events are those around partition and the later events are the expulsion of Asians from Uganda by Idi Amin. It's a book that discusses racism, belonging, family pressures, fitting in. And it's a book that really will educate you on your history if you don't know much about the history of Asians in Uganda. I didn't like this book, but I wouldn't throw it out if you are interested. Oza can string a sentence together nicely. She is just very ambitious with this book. The issue I have is the constant changing of perspective, the switching of timelines. I'd be investing in a character and then there'd be a whole new character and old characters would come back, but I'd have forgotten who they were. I'm really not the best with character names and remembering who everybody is. Once I get too many strings in a book, too many characters, too many timelines and too many themes. It just all becomes a tangled mess in my head and I can't follow the events. And that's what happened here. This could have been one of the best books I read all year if it just cut down on the perspectives and maybe had a few less characters and a greater focus on just one or two of them. I also really think that unless an author knows what they're trying to do when they're jumping timelines, just don't do it. Just don't do it unless there is a purpose to it. I know a book should be strong enough to be read in any order, but authors should be thinking about the best experience for the reader. And I just don't think that reading a book out of order is the best experience unless it is a way of building tension towards something that happens in the middle of the book or something. But these are issues that I am hypersensitive to as a reader. If you're quite good with multiple timelines and lots of changes of perspectives, I actually think that this is a wonderful book for you. Onto the books that I have actually finished now. A Country You Can Leave, A Sail Angel Ajani. In the quite late stages of this book, I decided I was going to DNF it. And as I was contemplating this book for the purposes of this video, I thought I might have been mistaken. This is something I really love about the reviewing process. It forces you to think about what you liked and what you didn't like in a book. And it's a real check to make sure you're present while reading a book. Unfortunately, in this instance, this was a mistake. This book only continued to get worse. 16 year old Lara is the black Cuban daughter of Russian immigrant Yevgenia who is white. The book starts with them being homeless and turning up to a trailer park and the mother is haggling for a cheaper price. There's this really interesting dynamic between mother and daughter here. The mother is a communist who hates Americans. The daughter is an American. The mother sees everything as a class issue. The daughter is called a monkey and thinks what does class have to do with this? The mother is highly sexual. The daughter is wondering if she is asexual. The mother likes to read books that ground her. The daughter likes to read books that help her escape. The mother wants to escape her life. The daughter wants to be grounded in her life. Yevgenia keeps thinking Lara is like herself. And Lara continues to grow into essentially the exact opposite person to her. This was the best aspect of the novel, but the plot is incredibly over the top. It is hypersexual, and it's really one of those books more caught up in what it wants to say than developing characters and relationships. There were just too many unbelievable things. The thing the mother does at the very end of the plot twist, even though that was foreshadowed, it still makes no sense. You can see the work the author has done to lead up to that event, but it's just so forced. The plot has been written and the characters pushed into the roles that they need to play. This is a book for somebody more concerned about ideas than the art of writing a book. And the book has really suffered for it. This is a pretty bad novel. This is how not to write a book. But it did make me laugh. So it wasn't a completely terrible experience. Editing Scott here, just a little correction. I've got myself muddled in the next review and I've called the book and the protagonist Adele instead of Adelaide. The books are Adelaide, the, the protagonist is Adelaide. I apologize for the silly error. Adele by Genevieve Wheeler. Adele adores Rory. She's the sort of girl who will send you muffins and milkshakes if you're feeling bad. And she even remembers if you prefer blueberry or apple and cinnamon. Rory alternates between being charming and absent. 
taking her out for great dates and then not talking to her for several days. We have all read the girl falls in love with a man who is just not that interested in her book. And what is the difference about this novel? Not a hell of a lot. There is a story of loss and grief that comes into the book later on. Here's my problem. Being an American living in London is not a personality. Being bookish is not a personality on its own. If you want to build up a personality of somebody with books, you can do that, but you can't be generic. To Kill a Mockingbird, The Catcher in the Rye, George Orwell, Conversations with Friends, and Harry Potter is not a personality. I am sure there are people who like all of those books. I am sure a lot of you have read all of those books, but they don't add up to form a personality. They're just famous books. And also, I know, there's a whole generation of authors who discovered their love of books through Harry Potter. But can we stop with all the references? It's just so cringe. It's just bad writing. Harry Potter is not even a book in the same genre as this one. And the author is just a horrible person. Comparing characters to Mrs. Weasley or whatnot is lazy. Every time it happened, I just asked myself if I should DNF. And if I had known the extent of the references, I, I would have. But every time I assumed it was the last one and I let the author indulge their nostalgia. But Come on, just buy some fan art or something. Don't put it in your novel. Look, girl dating an absent man. You know what that sort of book is. You know if you like that sort of book. And if you don't like it, don't bother reading this one. And if you do like it, there are better books out there. Night Wherever We Go. Tracy Rose Payton. This is the story of a group of women who are slaves living together on a plantation. The Lucys are the plantation owners and the slaves think that name is short for the Lucifers. The Lucys are advised to get women slaves because they work hard and they give you a second source of income. You just need to make sure that you don't create that income with your own seed. That is such a disgusting way to talk about another human being. But also, I can see the commercial logic in that form of thinking and I think that's why it's so disgusting. The story is essentially these slave women plotting how not to get pregnant while their owner is trying to force them into having babies. I didn't know that chewing cotton root prevented pregnancy and also induced labour. I love learning these kinds of facts. A lot of novels I have read have spoken of some of the old methods for avoiding pregnancy and I just find it really interesting because we're brought up with this belief that the contraceptive pill is the first time women could take control of their bodies when actually they've had a variety of natural treatments available for a long, long time. Back to the book, there was this plot about trying to escape and a plot of about love as well. One of the women in the book was married to a free black man and he would come down and try and see his wife but the plantation owner didn't trust free black men. He told the husband he could only continue here if he signed himself over to him as a slave. There was also this woman who was married to a man on a different farm and I felt like this was such a smart way of discussing how black families were broken up under slavery. On the negative side there are these three Three different plots going on. There are six women, there are various men as side characters, there are the owners, there's the owners, business partners, friends, neighbours, and all of this is done in under 300 pages. And this is a sprawling novel that really needed 600 pages to slowly develop. It ends up being spread too thin and it feels like it lacks focus, it feels rushed, and the major plot points are not properly explained. It's a real mixed book because it has some really thought-provoking and emotive writing that I really love. And the author is undoubtedly talented, but they didn't quite get this one right. And they just needed license to put a few more pages in their book. August Blue, Deborah Levy. Elsa is a 34-year-old pianist who has recently walked off stage in the middle of performing a Rachmaninoff piece. She has moved to Greece and then subsequently around Europe to give piano lessons. She is depressed and this mirrors Rachmaninoff's life. 
She has also dyed her hair blue as a symbolic act of the new person she has become. Elsa is an orphan who was originally called Anne and is originally from Ipswich. Her mother gave her up so that she could be adopted by a piano master who transformed her into a child prodigy. In Greece, Elsa sees her doppelganger buying a mechanical horse horse and becomes obsessed with her and also with her own mother. I think what Levy is ultimately trying to do is create this conversation around identity, career, happiness, love, family. But what we have is some very nice prose, a very strong setting, which is impressive considering how short the book is and how often it changes locations, and some strong character work, but not a lot else. For me, this really reminds me of books such as Whereabouts by Jhumpa Lahiri, or a Rachel Cusk novel where the characters are less manic and maybe on a little bit of Valium. But this is a much stronger novel than those two books. This is a short novel. For me, somebody who likes to read one book at a time and doesn't like to read the same type of book back to back, it was a nice read in between books that were more melodramatic or exciting. Open Throat, Henry Hoke. A novella about a mountain lion from the point of view of the mountain lion who is living in Hollywood near the Hollywood sign. The lion remembers and considers quite a lot. Why did its father hate it and why did he want to kill him? Why is the mountain lion on the outskirts of society? Why do those humans not like those humans who live over there? Side note, it's because they're homeless, but the lion doesn't realise that. What is the lion's gender identity and does the lion want to fit in and become human or would it prefer to eat the humans? Hoke is comparing the desire to fit in and suppress who we truly are with the idea of a wild animal living with people. Are we holding back our natural instinct or do we just want to eat people and find out what they taste like? This is simple, playful, fun, and short, as well as having something interesting to say. Quite a good novella. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. Gish Jen. A collection of short stories about China and America, the cultural differences, about America's anti-communist ideas clashing with China's pro-communist ideas, about American brainwashing clashing with Chinese brainwashing, or maybe just Chinese fear. It's a real East meets West kind of book. I definitely think it was way more critical of Chinese authoritarian left rhetoric than it was of American capitalist right rhetoric. But I think the criticism went both ways. Certainly US understandings of different culture was on display, but even that had a reverse to it, you know, at points showing the Chinese misunderstandings of the US. The individual short stories here are connected. You find clues or answers to what has happened to some of the characters in other short stories. I thought that nicely added to things, but I also found it a little confusing. As I've already said in this video, I'm not the strongest with character names. And I think if I was much better better with that. I might have got a little bit more out of this. With any collection of short stories, you will always get the criticism. Some stories are stronger than others. But the first story was the best. So as a general bit of advice, if you start this collection and don't enjoy that first short story, DNF this one. It's, it's really easy. The thing that I think good short story collections do is they add to each other. They're stronger for the presence of one another. And this collection does that. The constant comparison of US cultures and Chinese cultures. Chinese people living in the US making new connections that represent both the cultures of their parents and ancestors and the cultures of the land that they're moving to. I think that this is a fantastic example for anybody looking to write a short story collection of how that art is different to a novel and what needs to be done differently. On the downside, I really do think the characters could have been a bit stronger. I was sort of still piecing things together when the short story ended and I just think I needed that little bit more time with each story. The Memory of Animals, Claire Fuller. This is quite a unique novel. I've only read two novels by Claire Fuller before, but science fiction and dystopian are not what I associate with her writing. If you're interested in Fuller because you liked Unsettled Ground and want another book similar to that, you will be disappointed disappointed in this novel. That's not to say this is a bad novel, I actually think it's quite a good novel, but it's important to know that it's a completely different book to make sure that your expectations are correct. 
Nephi has agreed to be part of a vaccination trial. There is currently a pandemic sweeping across the country and there is no cure for it yet. But they think they have one and all that's left is human testing. Nephi is injected and becomes very sick. While Nephi is suffering from fever and generally sleeping a lot, you start to realize that something has gone very wrong. A new variant has emerged and it's causing memory loss and society is crumbling. It's seems like the vaccination trial has been abandoned. Once Nephi is awake, she discovers four others who are part of the trial and they try to figure out a plan to survive. Leon, one of the four, has been working on a device that helps you revisit memories and Nephi begins revisiting memories of her father, of her boyfriend, of her first love, an octopus. Fuller is having a conversation about the pandemic, but she's doing it with a comparison to how we treat animals to captivity and aquariums. She's also including terminal illness. Cephalopods and octopuses are all through this novel. Their intelligence, their ability to tell human emotion, the fact that they know they're in captivity, the fact that they try to escape. This is thoroughly interesting and a really engaging book. But I never had that wow moment that made it next level good. For me, this is a bad book from a super, super talented author. It's still really good, but you kind of feel disappointed because you know that Claire Fuller can do even better. That being said, I think that this is the best pandemic novel that I have read ever. Which is to say, I haven't seen anybody really knock that out of the park yet, but this is a step above anything else I've read in that vein. I would describe this as a literary fiction with a dystopian science fiction setting rather than science fiction or dystopian. I really, really do recommend this book, but maybe it's not the best book for Claire Fuller fans. She does seem to be branching out a little bit and this does seem to have a slightly different audience to her usual style of book. Wayward, Amelia Hart. This is a light fantasy novel about three witches all from the same family. One living in 2019, one living in 1942, and one in 1619. It is essentially three stories about the treatment of women. Three very feminist stories showing us just how much and how little has changed over the years. 1619, Eltha is a awaiting trial. A local farmer has been stampeded to death by his herd and Eltha is on trial for being a witch. When she was a girl her mother taught her what herbs needed to be used to treat various illness and this was seen as evidence of witchcraft. In 1942, Violet is living with her father and brother. She is trying to find out what has happened to her mother, and as World War II rages, her cousin comes to visit, and you soon realize that her father is hoping that this might end in marriage. In 2019, Kate flees London from her violent and abusive boyfriend. She has inherited Wayward Cottage from her auntie Violet, the same Violet from 1942, and she hasn't told her partner partner about this. She plans to live there in secret while she rebuilds her life. This is a book about how women are controlled by men through violence. It is a book about domestic violence and rape, but it is also a book about the strength of women and about empowerment. One thing that I think is really hard to do with novels that have three separate storyline is how does the author keep the reader interested in each storyline and not sacrifice things like the character development, the plot, or the themes? And I think Amelia Hart has done this wonderfully. At the end of each chapter, we change perspective, we change timelines. And at the end of each chapter, I was simultaneously disappointed to be leaving one story and excited to be re-entering the next. This is simultaneously a wonderful, entertaining piece of escapist literature with some really grounding real world emotional experiences. It is such an easy book to invest in, such an easy book to enjoy. You've got that horror and emotional impact of control and violence along with just a wonderful plot or rather three wonderful plots. I think Amelia Hart is so talented because even the stories in these books are quite different, yet they're linked, and that requires the author to have multiple different styles of writing that she is good at. And it really does have super broad appeal. I really struggle to see anybody hating on this book unless you find domestic violence and rape triggering or upsetting, in which case 
avoid this book. Everybody else, this is a good one. This is a banger for so many different readers. Bourneville, Jonathan Coe. This is a rich, sprawling novel, essentially about Britain. This is a family history told at various points in English history. The end of World War II, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth, the 1966 World Cup, the royal wedding, the death of Diana, Brexit, and it's told with Bourneville, a suburb of Birmingham where Cabris is ma based, centering on the novel. Co is able to really mix this family's history with the history of Britain, or maybe that should be with the history of Bourneville. If there's a character that takes centre stage here, it would have to be Mary, who starts out as an 11 year old girl and ends up as a grandmother. Co is able to retell a painful memory of his mother through Mary. You feel like this book is in part a tribute to her. Racism is such a central theme to this book. It starts off in this post World War II timeline as racism towards anything German is evident. This is especially interesting as part of our family has German heritage. It also has a variety of opinions on that heritage and on those cousins. Later on we see several characters of Indian origins. In one scene the family is watching the wedding of Charles and Diana and they meet a brown woman for the first time and one of the brown characters comes into the room and it's the first time these people meet and somebody comments, ooh there's Nancy Reagan as the camera's switch and then somebody else turns to this Indian woman and says oh hello Nancy Reagan nice to meet you instantly including her in the banter and fun but then we also see somebody else say oh well they're nice enough but who's gonna eat these samosas they brought over anyway and another character refused to even talk to them such a variety of opinions on show in one family such a variety of attitudes which really do represent the attitudes of a country. Co is able to show how politics become personal, how Brexit can affect a family. He's able to show how attitudes have shift and how attitudes have stayed the same. He's able to celebrate a nationality and call out nationalistic supremacy. Cabris plays a central role to this story. The adding of vegetable fat in wartime causing some European countries to not even consider it chocolate and how it changed from the center of industry to an importer of chocolate. I think Co is probably a bit too nostalgic and unbalanced here. Cabris is a company that is clearly part of the British identity, but it is also a terrible company that profits off some incredibly evil acts. Britain and the historical colonizing force that it was and how it's profited off many countries can sort of be seen through Cadbury's today and how it intentionally obscures its supply chain to have plausible deniability over slavery within the cocoa bean farms that it uses. Yet at the same time, knowing that their massive buying power drives down prices and that the only way these farmers can make money off them is to use slaves. This for me is a real missed opportunity. That simple conversation would have made this book go from very good to exceptional. Co paints both an interesting and personal, a complimentary and critical portrait of his country over the last 80 years. It's engaging, well written, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I do not expect this will be the last you hear of this book. Your driver is waiting. Priya Guns. Damini is an Uber driver, or I think in the book they call it rideshare. She's exhausted. She is living paycheck to paycheck. Her father has just died. Her mother is depressed. She may soon be homeless and she is working stupid hours for not enough money. Damini is brown and she meets Jolene, the perfect girlfriend, attractive and ally, caring. But Damini has never dated anybody with money before or anybody white. This book feels very playful, but it's also very heavy. I think financial insecurity is something that is very hard for people to empathize empathize with if you've never experienced it. And I think people always think that they've experienced it worse than they actually have. I think it's especially hard to empathize with if you have a rich or a stable family. 
I really like the pulp song Common People for that line, but still you'll never get it right, because when you're laid in bed at night watching roaches climb the wall, if you call your dad, he could stop it all. Priya Gunn is fantastic at taking you inside the head of Damini. She can't pay her bills, yet she's buying her little luxuries, her chocolate bars. The thing that people don't often get is that when money is tight, you can tighten your belt and go without. But when it doesn't matter how tight you make your belt, when you don't have enough money coming in and you just physically can't pay everybody and you know that it doesn't matter what you're going to do, you're going to fail, then you just give up a little bit and you take those small luxuries and then you feel judged about those small luxuries and you're constantly justifying them to yourself. And that was wonderfully represented. I thought this relationship was also very interesting. The poor, hardworking brown girl with the rich white girl who thinks she is doing it tough but is lucky enough to have mum and dad help her out for a bit her own words. This book really captures the corporate squeeze on workers, the wage loopholes, the growing disenchantment with society of the youth. It also shows us the racism that exists within modern society. This is an absolutely superb novel, character focused, relationship focused. It somehow manages to make me both empathize with the character situation and have a good time reading about horrible things. It was so good at keeping things up and light without diminishing the heavy issues that it was discussing. One of the best novels I have read this year. When things are alive, they hum. Hannah Bent. If you're a fellow Aussie, I know I'm pushing it calling this book a new release. But if you live anywhere else in the world, this book was released in very late 20. 22. And also, it's so incredible. I just want to shout about it from the rooftops. Obviously, metaphorical rooftops. I'm terrified of heights. Marlo is in her 20s and she's living in London researching a rare breed of butterfly. She has a chance at a career doing something weird that she loves. Her younger sister Harper lives with her father in Hong Kong in her family home and her heart is failing. This causes Marlo to fly back home to be with her sister. Harper also has Down syndrome, something she calls Up syndrome. A really appropriate name because she's so positive, she's so easy to like. She's a forgiving and kind character and sees the world with a simple clarity of wanting to be nice to everybody and wanting everybody to be nice to her. Harper is in love with her boyfriend Lewis, a boy who also has the Up syndrome. He's not as high functioning as Harper, but he's also committed to making everybody happy, especially Harper. Harper needs a heart transplant and nobody will put her on the waiting list. There are a variety of reasons for this. For example, she also needs a lung transplant and the chances of finding a donor is rare. The waiting lists are long, but every doctor also brings up her ability to contribute to society and how the heart could save somebody else's life. Basically, Harper is denied because she is disabled. This brings us to the central theme of this novel. Who has the right to live? Marlowe discovers that it's easier to get an organ donation in China and starts seeking them out through some less than official channels. And this brings up a complex and incredibly evil political issue. Where do these organs come from? Why does China have a supply of organs that makes them the official organ donor tourism capital of the world, while Hong Kong doesn't have enough organs to go around? Harper also doesn't want a new heart. She doesn't really understand what's going on, but she knows she loves Lewis. She knows she loves her sister and her father. She doesn't want a new heart. She wants to love the people she loves. And nobody listens to Harper's wishes in everyday life except for her father and her sister. But when it comes to saving her life, how important is it to listen to her wishes? Harper and Marlo also lost their mother recently and Harper's terminal illness brings up some unresolved trauma. Is Marlo's desperate desire to save her sister about saving her sister or is it somehow wrapped wrapped up in the trauma of losing her mother, in her obligation, in her grief, in her sense of family, in her disappearing family. This book is so emotional, it's sad, but it's also happy. It taught me stuff about the world I live in. It has 
fantastic characters and it puts these characters under such stress and it sees how they respond and it shows how these characters change in stressful situations. It's thought provoking and it asks really big questions. I have read and finished over a hundred books this year so far but this is the best book I have read in 2023 so far. This book will be hard to find, but I really do recommend you track it down and make it a priority to read. If you like new release literature, please make sure you subscribe to this channel, like this video, it makes the YouTube gods happy. Let me know your thoughts on any of the books that I've read here or on any of the books you're planning on picking up in the comments section. I hope you found something fantastic to read. Bye bye.